So, without further ado, let's give uh, Ella Meacham a hand. Thank you so much, Olivia. And I have to say, I sound better on paper, I think, than in person. Um, but uh, I am so happy to see all of you here. I'm so glad that you were able to come. Um, I uh, started on this book back in um, around 2007, and it took me about literally 10 years to work on it, um, to get it to publication and get the final manuscript. Um, but I think part of what kept me going was uh, one of the things I wanted to do both for myself and for um, both of my, for myself and for um, my students and Mississippians in general is um, I was trying to understand a little bit more about why Mississippi is the way it is and how it has come to be. Um, and but I found that this was a really um, a compelling story and I really wanted to try to do it justice. And because I live and work in Oxford, um, I feel like I'm sort of obligated to quote William Faulkner anytime I go to talk. And so the, the idea for my book came from uh, uh, something uh, that Faulkner describes well. When someone asks him where, of course, his were, he says they were fiction, have been living in the area, I found quite a lot of it was not fiction, but he said the ideas for him, a story usually begins with a single idea or memory or mental picture. And for me, the story began with um, reading a book by my colleague, Curtis Wilkie, who had been a reporter in the Delta and um, the early and mid 60s and he ha was there when Robert Kennedy came through and he had about a page a description of Kennedy in this um, uh, the son of America's promise and privilege and um, power just had been at the, the top of um, the American um, political system in this crumbling shack in 1967 Mississippi Delta, trying to coax a response from a listless child. And after several minutes with this child, with little response, the senator was, pro he was a Senate, U.S. senator at the time, was profoundly moved. And he walked out the back door to speak with reporters. And what he said was, America must do better. What he, and the, um, and he didn't say a lot. You could watch the video and he seems um, just kind of stunned, uh, but he's, he talks about how if we can spend so much money on armaments and if we could spend um, as consumers so much money on um, how on our pets and um, so many other kinds of luxuries of life, then we ought to be able to feed our children. Mississippi, uh, Miss, not just Mississippi, but America should feed our children. He privately told an aide that it was the worst thing he had ever seen in this country. Um, that day, April, um, in April of 1967, as he toured the Mississippi Delta up in the northwest side corner of the state, um, he talked with mothers about how they fed their children. He went in and asked if he could go in their kitchens and looked in their refrigerators to see what they had in their cabinets. Um, he asked children what they had for breakfast um, and what they had for lunch that day and what they were, asked the parents what they were gonna feed their children later um, uh, when the children got home. And the depths of deprivation that he found in Mississippi stunned Kennedy. And because of the press coverage that um, inevitably went wherever he went with him. Um, it, those images stunned the nation. And um, if you think about, if you think back to 1960s um, post-war television and the kind of shows that people saw, um, the, it, was a, it was almost uniformly a picture of prosperity. Um, and so when they saw these images of these families um, who were suffering and um, so uh, just without, with so little resources and so little, um, even the necessities of life, 
um, it, it created, it, it shocked quite a few people. Um, he was in Mississippi for only 48 hours. Um, and uh, there was a lot packed into that time, let me say. Uh, he did more than just encounter hungry children and um, parents desperate to feed them. Um, while he was here, he sparred with powerful members of the state's political elite. Um, these were officials who resented money spent really on anything for poor people, for children, for women. Um, it, they resented money, new federal money that was going to be spent on early childhood education. He toured job training programs and head start classrooms. He gave two impromptu speech, speeches while he was in Jackson, one to Millsaps, and, we, and one of the ladies here was telling me that she was in the audience that day, um, and another one at Tougaloo later that afternoon. Um, he dined, one on mostly white campus, and um, he dined with civil rights leaders, journalists, liberal business leaders and educators at a lovely suburban home. And in addition to that, he sat up late in the night and sipped scotch by the hotel pool and talked politics and baseball with local reporters. Um, he even took a nap in the guest room of a local Jackson pediatrician during that busy day. <laughs> um, when Kennedy arrived in Mississippi, it was a pivotal point in American history. After the speeches and protests and legal showdowns and violence of the 1950s and early 60s, Congress had finally slowly responded with some sweeping changes. There were new civil rights laws. There were enhanced protections for voting rights and um, new legislation uh, aiming at the war on poverty and great society programs. But further, furthermore, the war in Vietnam was going badly and Americans were beginning to realize it. Um, just a month before Kennedy arrived in Mississippi, Kennedy had stirred controversy by breaking with his party's leader, Lyndon Johnson, and offering a three-point plan to end the war. Then, a week before Kennedy toured the Delta, Martin Luther King, Dr. King, earned his own part of the current controversy when he publicly criticized the war for killing the nation's young people and siphoning money away from programs that were meant to help the poor. King told the congregation at Riverside Church in New York, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. Kennedy's visit in, to Mississippi provided a useful lens to examine the impact of these waves of changes. His visit was a catalyst that brought out the extremes of Mississippi's culture at the time. In Jackson, members of the Ku Klux Klan met him at the airport, carrying signs, castigating him for his position on Vietnam and distributing flyers predicting his death. They were only echoing the hatred of Kennedy that many white Mississippians harbored because of his role as attorney general in the integration of the Uni University of Mississippi, as well as other civil rights um, conflicts in the state. On the other hand, frontline civil rights advocates in Mississippi, like Marion Wright, were unimpressed with his record. They had struggled through life-threatening violence, deprivation of their civil rights, with little or no help from the Kennedy's administration's Department of Justice. They viewed Kennedy as a ruthless political deal maker who put too much priority on placating powerful Southern politicians in Congress. On the other hand, Kennedy and his brother, for, for all their faults, were still heroes to many of the ordinary black residents of the state. So in just about 48 hours after Kennedy landed to the shouts of the KKK, African American, as he was leaving the state, African Americans in Clarksdale cheered him. And as one journalist who covered it and traveled, traveled with him and covered it recalled, they were reaching up to him like they were trying to touch the robes of Christ. So as you can see, that was a, there was this wild dichotomy of reactions to his 
approach. There were hints of other changes in the air in Mississippi. The day before Kennedy arrived in Greenville, the daughter of Ronald Reagan, California's charismatic new conservative governor, was the guest of honor at a luncheon in, in Greenville designed to build support for Phyllis Schlafly as the conservative candidate for the president of the National Federation of Republican Women. The Greenville businessman, Clark Reed, who hosted Maureen Reagan Sills, had little interest in Kennedy's visit. He was long, had long been intent on building a strong business-minded Republican Party in the state to offset the unmitigated power of the Democratic Party that had ruled the solid South for so long. And the very day that Kennedy left Jackson after the hearings here for the Mississippi Delta, Stokely Carmichael spoke in the same chapel at Tougaloo College where Kennedy had talked with students the evening before. Carmichael was a leading voice for a new breed of civil rights activists focused on black power. His passionate, uncompromising rhetoric was thrilling African-American students across the South and rattling the establishment, as you could probably guess, in the spring of 67. And he arrived in Jackson just days after a riot that had broken out in Nashville following his speech at Vanderbilt. And he left Jackson with a state lawmaker calling for charges of treason against him. But even with all of these forces rolling around the state and the nation, perhaps the most powerful and the, and the ones that are really relevant to the exhibit here today were the economic forces that were rolling through the Mississippi Delta um, as Kennedy arrived. In the first seven years of the 1960s, there had been changes in federal agriculture policies, new farming practices, set-aside programs that paid farmers not to farm, um, new, some additional mechanization, new herbicide chemicals uh, on the market. And in a few short years, this had left tens of thousands of farm workers out of a job and often without a home because many of them um, had lived, even though the sharecropping system had changed and shifted more to one of day labor, quite a, there were quite a few um, farm workers in the Delta who still lived on the land or close to the land where they worked. Um, sharecroppers and plantation workers and farm workers in the Delta had always been poor, but in 1967, the spring of 67, they were especially des desperate. Well-meaning war on poverty programs had in part worsened their plight instead of improving it. And it's weird to think about how that happened, um, but the way the system had worked up until that point for a, you know, about a decade or two following the, um, World War II was that um, federal food assistant ca assistance came in the form of commodities, which was like surplus uh, flour or cornmeal or peanut butter, things like that. Um, and uh, so they had kind of settled into a rhythm of where they would work during the season, during the cotton farming season, and then during the, uh, and, and, and be paid as day laborers. And then during the off season, they'd get by with whatever they had and some um, commodities. Well, the changes in the food stamp program, you may not remember, but in the early days, you had to buy the food stamps. They weren't, um, it's now called SNAP, it's, it's, they've changed. But when the food stamps came out, you bought them for pennies on, for percentage on the dollar. Um, but what had happened was with the, once these herbicide people stopped far, farmed a lot fewer acres, they didn't need, um, pre-emergent herbicide. I've heard the commercials for uh, ever since I've been in Mississippi. But what that meant was that killed the weeds before they came out. And until that point, you needed somebody to, to dig up the weeds and pull the weeds until the plant got tall enough to survive on its own. But, and that's what you needed hand, a lot of hand labor for. That got rid of, they got rid of that. Um, and so suddenly tens of thousands of people had no daily work, very little daily work, no money coming in, 
and they couldn't get the free commodities anymore because they had to buy food stamps. Now, in some other parts of the country, food stamps gave poor people a lot more options to be able to buy vegetables and so forth and so on. Um, but in the Delta, um, and it just kind of shows that, you know, a one-size-fits-all doesn't always work. Um, it made their plight worse. Uh, and so Kennedy um, was serving on a committee in Washington um, that was some of these programs were coming up for reauthorization. And they had a hearing in March. And Marion Wright Edelman, who was one of only um, five black lawyers in the state and the only woman at the time um, who had passed the Mississippi Bar, first woman to pass the Mississippi Bar, Marion Wright, later became Marion Wright Edelman. Um, she was, um, uh, came up to testify. She was uh, working um, with the legal defense, NAACP Legal Defense Fund in Jackson. And she came to um, Washington to testify and about how the impact that some of these programs were having, and they weren't actually helping what people were doing. And she just looked at them and said, people are starving. Um, and if they don't get some help by winter, I don't know what's going to happen. And so the committee took a break and decided that they would bring the Senate hearing to Jackson. Um, and so that was the reason he came and they had a, a hearing and, um, uh, several of the Mississippi um, Senator, Senator Sinis was there, and um, they had the hearing at the Heidelberg Hotel. There's some pictures from the exhibit in the exhibit over there. Um, and while he was at this public hearing, they heard um, from people like Miss Fannie Lou Hamer and um, You Need a Blackwell and Others, uh, Head Start teachers who said, we have children who come in and have, um, they haven't even had a glass of milk uh, in months. Um, they, uh, and, um, they heard a litany of statistical woes, infant mortality, persistent childhood anemia, all of those things, but nothing prepared Kennedy for the emotional impact of meeting and holding those babies. And you've got to think about, he was a man who had, at that time, 10 children with the 11th on the way. Um, and so one of the things that he was really struck by, because he knew, he knew roughly, like also he was one of nine, a lot of babies around him all his life, and he knew the kinds of milestones that children should be hitting. And so when he saw these children, they would say, oh, he's seven, he's five, he's six. And he could see where they were and what had, how their um, lack of food and lack of good, healthy um, environment had affected them. Uh, he was deeply troubled by it. Um, and so on his return to Washington, he immediately began seeking ways to help the children he met in Mississippi. But he ran into a lot of denial and disbelief. In fact, the head of the um, U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture's um, Orville Freeman, he said, there's nobody in America that doesn't have any income. Everybody has income. He couldn't, he, he didn't believe him. And he's like, I just met him to death yesterday. <laughs> I just met them yesterday. And the interesting thing about Kennedy too that I found is that he was, he had been led around, like he was a rich man's son. He had been led around all his life for people trying to get him to see what they wanted him to see or do what he wanted him to do. So he would make impromptu stops as he traveled through the Delta. He'd make impromptu stops um, and knock on doors and say, um, and talk to people. He would, if they took him into one house, he'd go out the back door and into a, the neighboring house to see. Um, so he was, he was making sure that he wasn't just being shown, like what he was being shown was accurate. Um, it's hard to believe now that um, it, a year from the election, Kennedy had not decided to run for president um, in 68. In fact, he, most of his friends and at that point, he was going to wait till 72 um, before he ran. Um, but the institutional obstacles and powerful men who were indifferent to the suffering of these poor children made getting aid to them much harder than he expected. Um, 
he just couldn't shake the memories of the children he said and he talked about it even when it wasn't politic or popular for the rest of his life and by the time he ran for president people would say like there were a couple of columnists national columnists would say like why does he keep talking about people in Miss poor people in Mississippi? He needs to focus on this or that. Um, why does he keep talking about this? It's not, you know, they weren't quite as poll driven as people are today, but that's kind of what he was saying. Um, uh, in fact, just even a few minutes before he was shot and killed, he was um, talking about the children that he had seen in Mississippi and um, their responsibility. Um, uh, so today, just as in 67, the juxtaposition of Kennedy with the destitution in Mississippi makes for a compelling story, but it's not the whole story. Um, it was often, well, I found it was often recounted in history books and um, biographies of Kennedy as this pivotal moment, but the people that he met um, were faceless and frequently nameless. There were only two reporters who even recorded the names of the people he met. And I'm forever thankful to Bill Miner and Curtis Wilkie um, uh, because most of the other reporters just would say a poor black woman or a poor uh, mo a mother or a farm worker or something like that. They didn't even bother to record their names. Uh, and I didn't want to just write a book about um, a politician, a white politician coming in as a kind of um, like this uh, main hero in a morality play and they were just the stock characters. Kennedy never represented him as, himself as such and it's hard for us to believe but today we're used to celebrities who travel to places to bring use their fame to draw attention but Kennedy's was not and, and his, his uh, aides Peter Edelman, and they were quick to tell me it was no poverty tour. Um, he was there, it was a fact-finding mission as part of his job as a senator. And so um, he was very firm about wanting numbers. He got very uh, upset with a school official who couldn't tell him at this federal job program of anybody who'd actually gotten a job because they weren't tracking it or um, of the people who'd gone through it. Um, and uh, Daniel Shore, the CBS newsman who covered the trip, he, in his coverage, he called him, like, he said he's like an inspector general. Um, so, it, which is a far cry from celebrity just using his fame to get attention to the issue. Um, and he kept that focus all that whole summer on trying to get some emergency food aid to the Delta. Um, they had hearings in July, but he found convincing these officials very difficult. Um, and uh, he couldn't understand. He wasn't naive, he understood it, but he just found it kind of shocking. And, and, as, and in the, you'll see um, some reference to some of the violence of the summer of 67. Um, and as that unfolded, and he watched Johnson's response to it, where he shifted from being sort of a poverty advocate to, to being really firm on um, and, and trying to sort of bring the hammer down and uh, up with, um, you know, sort of law and order kind of um, harsh tactics, he felt uh, he was, um, really disturbed by that because I think he felt like his trip to Mississippi and then after that to Kentucky, um, to the field, uh, fields in, in California where the farm workers were there, Indian reservations. Once he saw it, he started seeing it everywhere. And he felt like that that was not the approach that was gonna be successful in solving problems. And that's part of what he, he felt like that, he had an obligation to run for president because of the solutions, how he disagreed with Johnson's solutions to that. Um, you know, Mississippi officials, uh, folks like um, Congressman Jamie Witten, who was a um, very, very powerful uh, congressman who represented a good bit of the Delta, when um, CBS, after Kennedy went, it brought more attention and CBS sent some crews down. There was a good bit of news coverage. Um, 
Witten had it read into the congressional record that the people that he saw, that those um, cameras filmed in Marks, Mississippi, which you'll see in this exhibit was a crucial part, that they were just actors um, who were given, they were actors given um, raggedy clothes for um, uh, the cameras. And then they got in their fancy car and drove away. Um, that's, that was what, uh, how um, resistant he was. And, you know, his resistance was not just rhetorical. He controlled the budget for the Department of Agriculture with an iron fist. And so any changes or any emergency food aid or anything had to go through him. And he was a, a great obstacle to it, even though you could take as one um, reporter who covered the, well, um, ed editor, many of y'all may know, Hotting Carter, he said, you could take, I could take Jamie Witten by the hand and walk him 50 yards outside of his house and he'd see all the, um, the hungry children um, uh, that he'd want to see in the world. So, um, uh, so, I did, but as I said, I didn't really want to only focus on Kennedy. So what took me so long to write the book was I wanted to find some of the children that he met and tell their stories and bring us up to date. Um, and so uh, especially this child, this listless child that was so um, in such uh, difficult um, and painful circumstances, Miss Annie White and her children. And so um, the name White is a common one. The family, many of them had left the area uh, and I was stumped for quite, quite a while trying to find them. Um, but I ultimately did find, it was, his name is David, that child's name is David White. Um, he, he, the, after Kennedy visited, his brother told me that it's not, a, it's not a fairy tale. These children still faced a lot of struggles and difficulties, but they did, so he said, um, county officials had denied welfare because in those days the county could deny welfare to anybody they considered bad character. And so, which they usually did. And he had been there twice, his mother had been there twice asking for help to feed her, her children and um, been turned away. But said the next day after Kennedy came, they were knocking on her door. And after that, there was some money for, um, they remembered there was a little money, there was more money for food. And also in those days, um, counties could, and school boards, districts could refuse school lunches. So these children were going to school. They weren't getting the school lunches, school free school lunches, free school. Um, uh, it was available since I think the 50s, but um, the, the local district could refuse it, and they did, um, in, in, the, in Cleveland at least, uh, where their family and Miss Annie White's daughter Edna told me about her teacher bought a ticket every week and would give it to a different child each week. And so for one week, you would get to eat. And just the joy on her face recalling that week when she got to eat was heartbreaking. Um, uh, just, just incredibly poignant. But so my book focuses on four families that Kennedy encountered on that and the children and what happened um, as they grew up. Um, and um, I will say that Miss Annie White's grandson, um, uh, Edna's son, is a freshman at Tougaloo this year, um, just starting. And uh, then some of her other grandchildren, they moved to Texas and they've, they've gone on to, to um, do some good things too, but uh, um, so I really wanted to bring the people that he met into the light of history as well and bear witness to both to their suffering and their perseverance because um, they had, many of them have overcome tremendous obstacles in spite of the obstacles uh, that to, to do, um, to make lives for themselves and um, uh, I admire them and I appreciated them sharing their stories with me. I, I consider it a great honor. Um, so uh, here uh, I will say that on um, April 4th, 1968, many of you all will recognize that um, fateful day, Kennedy was 
campaigning in um, Indiana for the primary, and we've heard a lot about the speech that he gave at, um, after Dr. King's assassination. Um, but that day he was rolling out his plan on the campaign trail for poverty. And so he had some, two big speeches at Ball State and Notre Dame and um, elsewhere uh, uh, to talk about what he planned to do to address the things that he saw both in um, Mississippi and, and other, elsewhere in the country. Um, and he told, he saw, um, he saw the efforts to feed hungry people in America in patriotic terms. And he um, said, he told the, in, one, in his speech, he said, if the United States cannot feed the children of our nation, there is very little we will be able to do to succeed in living up to the principles which our founders set forth nearly 200 years ago. This is our nation. It is for us to turn this nation toward a path of honor. Um, and so I will end with that, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions um, or any comments. There are uh, some, several uh, great exhibit. I would encourage you to just read all of it. Um, oh, and I guess I didn't, one thing I did, let me say, I did forget to mention that because Kennedy was so impressed by what he saw, by actually seeing and talking to poor people, this is crucial. Um, Marion Wright, who had by that time had come to, uh, was spending a lot of time in Washington because she and his, um, one of his aides, Peter Edelman, had fallen in love. She was getting ready to go to Atlanta and she came by to say goodbye and he was outside by the pool and he, she said she was gonna see Dr. King. And Dr. King had been working on the Poor People's Campaign and this thing for a long time. Um, but Kennedy just said to her, well, tell him to bring the poor people to Washington. Bring poor people to Washington so leaders can see it, so, the, so American people can ignore it. Um, and she said that when she got to, because they, didn't, they had had a contentious, with good reason, past. They weren't, they weren't close, King, King and Kennedy, um, even though some of their goals overlapped or their, their ideals overlapped. They... Um, coming from very different places but she when she told him that she said he said he had been kind of depressed and when she said that Kennedy said bring the poor people to Washington he sat up and said you know sort of just looked at she said like like I was an angel bringing a message um, so uh, certainly um, the plans for the poor people campaign um, had been in the works for a long time, but I think that the timing, may, his, his message, I think, helped him think more clearly about the timing and, and that, that it might, might be receptive to more people in Washington than he expected. So uh, I definitely wanted to get that in there. So um, anything? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. So Thank much. you. Thank you. I was thrilled to be here. Uh, Y'all were great. Encouraging awesome audience. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen, for coming down from Oxford. Um, we really appreciate you a lot. Um, I just want to tell you a couple things. Like I said, we have our exhibit here until September 24th. So we have a few more things we're doing. Um, we're going to actually have a community solidarity day on Sunday, September 17th. And it's gonna be in direct correlation with the Community Solidarity Day they had at Resurrection City, paying um, homage to those who left from all over the country to go and create this Resurrection City for the people that were on the National Mall protesting poverty in America and all the other issues um, that were taking place. And so we're gonna have Jackson Hines Comprehensive Health Center here um, doing a whole health fair we're going to have yoga, we're going to have a cooking demonstration, we're going to have organizations from all over the city that are doing the great work that needs to be done. Um, and so please, September 17th from 12 to 5, you know, every Sunday we're free. So come and see us. <laughs> um, so that's what's coming up next. And then on September 21st, our last gallery talk um, with our very own Louise Montgomery, who's in the back. Um, 
Oh, he's waving, but it is going to be Hispanic Heritage Month. And so Luis is going to talk to us about the uh, Hispanic organizers and those that came to Resurrect the City in D.C. and talked about the issues that um, Hispanic communities were facing and how all of that is still very relevant today. And like I said, September 24th, uh, this exhibit will close out. But if you have time today, please uh, feel free to look around. Like I said, we also have a lot about the Poor People's Campaign um, in our Gallery 7. And lastly... Um, Ella will be downstairs signing books. So uh, if you would like to purchase one, our bookstore has them. She's going to sign a few. Um, but if, if not, thank y'all so much for coming. And uh, hopefully we'll see y'all on the 17th or the 21st. Thank you.